Okay, um, thank you um, to Bergen Kunsthof for the invitation to do this lecture today on gift guys. Um, I'm going to um, launch right into it and briefly talk about crisis practice before um, discussing some more particular aspects of the work. Um, so today we'll be looking at a range of works by Jeff Geis, which I hope evidences a broader problematic between the term education and what it designates. The lecture will link Geis's practice to key educational precedents and artistic interlocutors, such as the models of education promoted by Paolo Freire with his, with his theories of critical pedagogy, the Bauhaus in Germany, and Nikolai Ladovsky's teaching at the Soviet Vojtomas. And here we have some slides. So as a brief introduc introduction, uh, Jeff Geis was an artist who lived and worked in the Barlen, a town in Flanders, Belgium, that is situated in De Kempen, uh, a rural region that encompasses part of the low countries that extends east, east of Antwerp and terminates in the southwestern part of the Netherlands. Much of Geis's work centers on this locale, reflecting the artist's position in the region's environment, history, language, and social relations, why Geis came to refer as its biotope or terroir, Vocationally, Geis taught positive aesthetics, his own invention, at the State Middle School in Barlin from 1960 to 1989. Positive aesthetics was Geis' own artistic practice alongside the presentation of a contemporary works of art, from Piero Galati to Daniel Bren to Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, he used this to heighten the students' awareness of the world around them, presenting concepts usually considered only for educated adults, such as concepts of contemporary art like happenings and wider social developments such as the feminist movement. Guy's staged projects in his classroom with his students and listed these activities among an inventory of artworks that ranged from 1947 until his death. For me, I think it's important that we begin with this inventory because while Guy's constantly referred to and reinterpreted his own work through his career, often repackaging old works or elements from his lifetime archive of materials and new forms. His inventory remains as a kind of log of all of, all of his activities. Although given the name inventory, many of its entries left little material trace besides their appearance in this short list. Importantly, what this inventory does formally is give all of Geiser's divergent activities as an artist the same standing, establishing an equivalence between forms, between activities of the artist in everyday life and all that is commonly recognized as a production of an artist. For us, it acts as an index of the artist's works while fundamentally challenging common ideas of what constitutes a work of art. While for Jeff Geis, we might guess that it was rooted in a kind of practical sentimentalism, logging everything from family events to works of art, from the commonplace to perceptively imminent. For instance, a, cl a class field trip to, the students, to visit the studio of Marcel Brutez the natural products of Geiser's garden, a drive with cabbages around the region to show them the countryside, his words, exhibiting at Documenta, the presentation of a snake handler in the classroom, the publication of the book All the Black and White Photos until 1988, which evidently compiles all of his black and white photos from the time he received a camera until the book's publication. appearances on television, and a number of letters addressed to the heads of state. Famously, one proposed to blow up the Antwerp Museum of Fine Arts, which was Geis's first show in a museum, and later a letter to Jacques Chirac. We can surmise that within all of this was a spirited questioning of art's position in the world, and consequently, the role of the artist in social life. It is across these many activities that Geis rearticulated modernity's question concerning the purpose of the artist into a mode of working that sensed the boundaries of the role. He tested its limits, asking what cir circumscribes the expectations of what an artist is and does. All of this goes towards an explanation of the work but does little to forward interpretation. In light of this, I want to ask, what does the worst work exactly produce? So um, when I originally wrote this talk, I began by asking myself how I think of the work of Jeff Geis from my position as a teacher, since like Geis, I'd been working at a primary school while also teaching at a university. Today, at least the university and education, I guess more broadly and spe specifically in the Anglo-Saxon context, 
university is designed as an institution oriented towards profit. But more generally, if we understand ideology as our lived and imagined relations to, towards the world, education institutions function in a way that reproduces certain ideologies that justify their position in the social order. But without distracting from Geis's work, I think what is most important to note here is the place of art within these systems, within its structures of knowledge and power, its publics and their types of discourse. What is clear today is that artists in the university, such as PhD or MFA candidates, are expected by the institution to know their work as if they were a proprietary right and to own and determine its meaning at every instance. We might agree that art in such a context is intentionally demystified. And there is also a similar expectation for curators and art historians too. We are expected to specialise in knowledges of certain periods, styles or artists' careers as a kind of capitalisation or an investment procedure in the individual, producing new gatekeepers and what I would call a certain career effect. On one hand, this may have the danger of shaping the discourses surrounding art as useful for the neoliberal university, its ideology and its aims. And on the other, it is a simple consequence of developed societies and their highly specialised divisions of labour. So I don't have time to go into an in-depth critique of that, but what I wanted to point out from this specific context of this talk is that this situation calls for the use of specialised discourses of art and art history, and that these institutions would like us to use in discussing works of art. Quite early on and long before uh, postmodernist discourse, um, Marxist art historian Arnold Hauser challenged the idea of a unitary art history and, by extension, a unitary audience for art. Rather presciently, Hauser saw that the reception of a work of art is composed of multiple publics at different periods with their own values, sensibilities, habits of viewing, and use values for these forms. I think it is important in this current globalised climate of contemporary art to re-engage the notion of publics in plural not only to pr prove the importance of certain localities, but to explain why certain works seem to have universal valid validity. On this front, Geiss's work is incre incredibly relevant, since, as we'll see, it consciously engaged multiple publics at different points of its reception. In the situation of this talk, I want us to think of this as one kind of public, one kind of reception for the work. What is important, what is somewhat ironic about this, and I'll explain this further down the track, is that I'm sure Jeff Geis was highly suspicious of this kind of totalising accounts of art that art historians often wish to make, especially about his own work. Quite rightly, I believe that Geis' suspicions came from an inherent dis distrust in how such knowledge seeks authority by appropriating the work through interpretation. While I think it's most important in this work is that it holds onto the liber liberating potential of the aesthetic project, which is to enable critical thinking. No place is this better demonstrated than in the in the place where I first encountered Geis' work, in the artist's own newspaper, the Kempfens in Vermontiblad. Here Geis published all of sorts of information with irreverent enthusiasm, from the expected in documentation and text on the artist's work to local advertisements, fiction, proposals, family photos and letters, in a sense working to further complicate his work rather than demystify it. And I think it is important to note here that Geis often talked about the role of camouflage in his work. But beyond Geis' own intentions, what his art can do well is prove that art is not so um, easily delimited nor prescribed by its discourses, by its criticism or interpretation. And although I'm providing you with plenty of background information, anecdote and personal research, I'm often led back to thinking that what is most important in this work is what we might find confounding about it in the first place, that there is a certain irritation to know it, which I think only leads you back to the beginning and back to the work itself. I think that this is the kind of circular logic which, which, was, which was natural to guys. This resistance to straightforwardness is perhaps what is most liberating or indeed permissive about Jeff Geis's art today. Geis's strategy was, to, it was in a way to intervene into a certain system. When we consider the records of these interventions, we should ask what these actions produced, keeping in mind that in many cases, making an objective work of art was not the goal or at least the sole aim. Rather, it was evident that Geis was looking to produce certain effects. Or in other words, he was interested in what these actions could do in certain contexts. From here on, I'd rather actually rather leave the word context behind and substitute it with that word from Hauser, public. 
so as to insist, so as to insist on the, that these were like relational and social gestures are not merely reflective on a certain circumstance. This is to reframe the question of why Geist did these things in the first place. In asking this question, it is important to think through why these activities took place at sites that are receptive of very specific publics, i.e. the school, the bar, the socialist women's club, etc., meeting each of them on their own terms of their own values, sensibilities, habits of viewing, and importantly, use values for the forms that guys would produce for such situations. Lastly, we should also note that in the scheme of this, the traditional sites of artistic reception, be it the museum or gallery, are treated in the same manner. This is all to ask. Um, at the level of a reception, what do these activities produce as social interventions? What I'm arguing is that Jeff Geis's activities, sorry, what I'm arguing is that in Jeff Geis's activities, there is evidence of these strategies in democratizing not only an understanding of the work of art, but also a thorough criticism of hierarchies of knowledge, how knowledge is accessed, who controls it, and in what languages and structures of power it can be located. If we speak strictly about his position in the classroom, Geis's experiments is in teaching in teaching art in rural high school, fundamentally question how aesthetic education is taught at its foundations. It was oriented towards the whole development of the individual, in a way recalling Jean-Jacques Rousseau's writing on education, yet differentiated by the fact that it insisted not on the sole individual, as in, as in Rousseau's Enlightenment humanism, but in one relationship to society. We have an image from the Bergen show. I believe that Gaius has achieved this by giving agency to his students, which resulted in a widening of the borders of what we consider to be the curriculum of the art class. He asked, could only the only Turkish student introduce the whole class to the Turkish language, which is that work there on the left, or could learning about geography and contemporary politics be just as important as the work of art, to the work of art, sorry, as line, colour and shape? Importantly, Gaius's methodology drew from a tradition of critical pedagogy elaborated, elaborated firstly by Brazilian educator Paulo Freire in his incredibly influential book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Ira Shaw later defined critical, method, uh, critical pedagogy as such. Habits of thought, reading, writing and speaking, which go beneath surface meaning, first impressions, dominant myths, official pronouncements, traditional cliches, received wisdom and mere opinions. To understand the deep meaning, root causes, social context, ideology, and personal consequences of any action, event, object, process, organization, experience, text, subject matter, policy, mass media, or discourse. These methods centered on the role of what Freire called um, conscientization. I will not um, bother with the, with the Portuguese pronunciation because I cannot do it. Um, a process of learning to perceive social, political, and economic con uh, contradictions, leading one to take action against the oppressive elements of a given reality. Such a pedagogy is not traditionally hierarchical, but rather by being focused on a dialogic process between the teacher and students. All participants are responsible for a process of learning, which is firstly social. Not only is this a critical rethinking of the role of the teacher as the owner of a certain knowledge, uh, be it depositing it in students in what Freire calls the banking system of education. But fundamentally, critical pedagogy is a rethinking of the role of the student from their position. This makes students active participants in a process that they possess, I mean to, uh, aiming to ultimately lead them to greater freedom and autonomy in their thinking. As Freire said himself, in this method of education, quote, People develop their power to perceive critically the way they exist in the world with which and in which they find themselves. They come to see the world not as a static reality, but as a reality and process in transformation. So I also want to um, flag that while we're discussing education, we should not think of Geist as a teacher since we never knew him personally as a teacher, but as an artist who made a body of work that we look at from a distance and experience as viewers. In these works, he demonstrated that the role of the artist, its position of authority, i.e. authorship, and its function could be rethought under similar terms uh, proposed by Frere, giving the role of reception a critical agency. 
in the sense we elect students. It's important that Geiss's work does not simply leave disinterested spectatorship behind. In lieu of the temporality of happenings is tricked to use value of social realism and some political art or the moralism of relational aesthetics. Rather, it fundamentally uses the simple and perceptual toolbox of aesthetic formalism to dismantle the preconceptions, myths, and authority of art and of the artist. Therefore, if we accept its premises, art like this begins with a certain invitation or perhaps the irritation to be consciously skeptical and ultimately critical of the taken for granted in how one experiences the world and engages with the work of art. With Feelings Playbox, originally made by Geis for his newly born daughter Nina in 1966, we might think as uh, we might think as some of the fundamentals of art making are brought into the domain of the child and the development of their emotional and sensory awareness. In this play box, which is not dissimilar to the Bauhaus building box set designed by Alma Seedolf Bucher, sorry, in 1923. Geist provided a, a variety of set shapes made of varying materials with the intention that each shape would vary in weight and um, weight and texture, changing and affecting the child's relation with these objects and their potential outcomes. Let's describe uh, Geist's friend and author Roland Pertu in the artist uh, newspaper Kempens of Marty Blyde, quote, The box contains all kinds of three-dimensional figures, cubes of different weight and texture. One cube is, for instance, covered with sandpaper and another with silk. What happens when someone touches the cube with sandpaper? Is it not indeed a matter of sensitivity of the skin, but also of mental reflex? Constructing with spheres, rectangles, cubes is not only a matter of the senses. According to the vision of Jeff Geis, it, is also, it also has to do with exploring the ABC of sculpture and its, cap and its characteristics. For some time, Jeff Geis expects a distribution on large scale of the emotional play box, but the interest is moderate and the play box is put away. So not only is such a tool engineered to create an effect in the child through their senses of touch and sight, but it is inherently intended to build emotional self-awareness into the child and their acts of making. Although designed at Nina's birth, the 10 boxes that Geis made were not put into practical use until 2005, when he was invited by the Van Arbe Museum in Eindhoven to make an exhibition. With the assistance of both the museum's curatorial and education departments, the 10 player boxes were distributed across Eindhoven's school system. What this demonstrated, which is noted by Anna Harding, is that, quote, the box indicated that children can be entirely open to the propositions of the conceptual artworks, more so than adults, who can have all sorts of preoccupations about whether something is art or not. Children will re readily get on with exploring a concept or proposition if it is interesting and can be very inventive with it. This is what interests the artists, to see the ideas being played with, which is essential to the completion of the work, which, is in, which in a static museum display would not allow. The feeling playbox shows that it was the fundamentals that interested guys most, not as established universal truths, but as the basic assumptions that we all start with in making sense of the world. For instance, what structures cl uh, and classifies hues into colors, uh, lines in, and space, uh, into shape. These relationships that we hem between certain forms and their meaning are not only the ground zero of language, but of all forms of knowledge. The same argument can be made in a much different example. For instance, in Geis's red heart motif. As in early 1966, Geis began using this design as both a signature and as an arbitrary form. In one of its first appearances, it appeared containing a list of numbers extracted from his personal identity cards and licenses, set within a self-portrait on the front cover of the, of the newspaper, The Kentifan Since for Marty Blood. It also appeared later on a bottles of cider during Geis's tenure co-running Bar 900, a cabaret and local social club in Barlin. And within the same contours, was baked as loaves of bread and sold in a gallery like any work of art. At times, it appears almost arbitrarily. In other words, it was ubiquitous within the artist's body of work. It was, in a sense, both a, 
that the trope of both a logo and a signature modeled to point to the artist as its referent while alluding to whatever associations one might equate with the heart and the breast is perhaps most simply a playful critique of modern art's most powerful authorial device, the signature, as a form easily equated with the functioning of the corporate logo. For me personally, it was like a scab asking me to uh, ask what had caused it. In Geist's work, the heart was one of the early examples of his interest in how a form can function as a mode of identification. He was interested in understanding what structures establish the channel of communication between a form and its referent, signifier and signified, and to attempt to create associations of being beyond arts established. This is a text from Jeff. Precisely during the the period 1960-1963, I was preoccupied with things such as form, what made form look different, camouflage, mimicry, in short, the hidden, the things which one seems to see, image forms which are shown in a relative, in, sorry, in a certain way, i.e. in a studied and correct way, under correct guidance, embedded in correct strategy, are readily accepted, as if they have existed all the time. Repetition while creating habit nearly at the same time, leaves a taste of deja vu. The end is an accepted boredom. Image forms, no matter how strong they are, may appear perfectly normal, submitted, tame, having reached the saturation point. The images are experienced as something retinal, which is also the experience one is looking for. The significance underneath it is kept at a distance. We're inclined to dispose of Im any images which cannot be used to finish our homework as mere scenery for more important things that we're supposed to have on our mind. To demonstrate this obvious wearing out of images, I started looking for basic forms with a very simple structure, but a heavily loaded content. So much of this investigation began early while Geist was studying at the Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp. He found that he was unsettled by the, quote, pure aesthetes he found at the Academy, reacting with the thought and maintaining until the end of his life that, quote, art was only a means. He was interested in the, in the sentimental materiality of things, their emotional affect. One early work consisted of burning precious letters from childhood sweethearts, crying in the ashes and using these to fertilize his own garden for new growth. This skepticism informed what he thought was expected of the artist in the academic context. In his words, I've always been interested in the truth behind things, the motivation going back at that time at this problem of classifying of visual thinking it's your environment that turns you into an artist, just as art is made. Actually, the word art is artificial. This is partly sociological and partly sentimental question. Uh, what fashions an artist would be elaborated after graduation, the guys received his license to teach and return to Baalin for work. It was at this time that he designed the coloring book for adults to alleviate his own impasse, creating this instructive work that we might think functioned for him as a way almost to teach himself how to be an artist. The coloring book infantilizes its subject, or at least makes them return to the foundations, prescribing to, it, uh, to its user an action as banal as coloring in the most commonplace of culturally loaded forms. It contains the themes of one, the gendered female form in art history, two, maps and geopolitical borders, notably, notably Vietnam, Three, the mid-century model home. Four, human anatomy. Five, the masculine image of the soldier. Soldier. Six, consumer commodities. And seven, the automobile. When I was rearranged, sorry, re-engaged in 2003 for an exhibition at the Museum für Gegenwart Kunst in Sagan, Germany, the coloring book was reprinted and distrib distributed to 99 school children in the area. Two copies were given to the children, one to be completed and one to be exhibited at the museum, and the other signed by Geis and returned to the children to keep. As recounted again by Anna Harding, Geis viewed this exchange of signatures as proof that they are equal authors, acknowledging that artists are invariably indebted or to or inspired by other people's images. The children are experiencing highly conceptual propositions about intellectual property, authorship and collaboration, and their participation is fully part of the conceptual work, not as an add-on workshop after the show is installed. And I think here we should be um, thinking of Freya once again. 
As an educational tool repurposed for the adult world, the Cohen book follows a pedagogical theme in Geiser's work that reflected the language surrounding his vocation as a teacher, while throwing its purpose into sharp contradiction. By being displaced into adulthood, the coloring book served a divisive purpose, irritating Western arts fixation on the creation of the autonomous work by a single, uh, singular individual, as well as, being, as well as the perceived need for a tool to serve a clear function. The search for model forms led uh, guys to, quote, rediscover the golden ratio as a metric based on the human figure. In many ways, the body became ground zero for Geist, pointing back to how he oriented himself towards the world as a resident of a small town, a teacher, organiser of community groups at socialist community centres, and as an artist within these contexts. Naturally, this directly references da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, the impulse to, to derive universal mathematic principles from the human form, and the transference of these principles from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, and finally, to the seriality of modernist capitalist production. His primary influence for making this central to his teaching and to his art was from Soviet architect and educator Nikolai Lodovsky, who imbued his teaching of architecture at the Vojtomas, which was the social equivalent, uh, sorry, the Soviet equivalent of the Bauhaus, with the quote psychological effects and spatial properties of form, as derived from practical human use and spatial perception. Importantly, the need to establish a tenet of universalism in art was of high importance to the Soviet avant-garde during the October Revolution, as they began to rethink art beyond the confines of class division. In writing of the establishment of this school, Sismond uh, Boyko has wrote that, quote, recognizing the principle of universalism in art, Kandinsky recommended an analysis of the media of expression from the viewpoint of their reactions on the mental and physical constitution of man. This proposal was taken up by Ladovsky in his teaching, which combined scientific aspirations with an approach to inventing spatial forms that took the psychological effects of the viewer and the scale of the body as their point of departure. Ladovsky's teaching, as early as the 1920s, promoted a synthesis between painting, sculpture and architecture. As Geist notes himself, Ladovsky was deeply convinced that good innovative architecture is possible only as a result of close cooperation between the producer, the architect, and the consumer, the masses. With his eye form of 1968, a year that saw considerable police violence in Europe and abroad, Jeff Geis outlined his body on the pavement and photographed what remained. As with the heart, he was interested in dealing with the shape of the body as the simplest identifying form of the individual. It signaled towards a broader dialectic and in Geiss's work between the particular, the body of the artist, Geiss himself, and the universal, the body as a general humanist form. This remained a productive contradiction for Geiss, underlining the problematics of humanism based within the contingencies of the individual's own body, Balin, Flanders, Belgium, etc., and the principles of universalism. A recurrent strategy in Geiser's work was to return to his own work, using his archives as material for his own for its own standing, as well as a way to re, uh, re-clarify occurring motifs, themes, or problems latent in the work. Quite literally, the archive was a tool not only for Geiser but also for his students in the classroom. In this early photograph on the left of Geiser's classroom, we can see two cabinets behind his desk. The cupboard on the right contains the inventory of tools available to the class. And on the left, we see ring binders in which Geist would keep a wide range of materials and plastic sleeves that pertain to his work. Students could freely consult this archive just as they could access their tools. For Geist, the archives functioned like a kind of feedback loop, informing new works while subsuming their sketches, documentation and and ancillary materials. If we think of this semi-private material, we should think of this as if there's the semi-private memory of Geiser's practice. Its public comparative was the artist's newspaper, which functioned in a way that was not dissimilar. This tendency towards re- recurring, but, uh, sorry, recurring themes and forms works in a kind of circular, circular logic, quite often literally recycling pr- previous works. Keeping in mind that the I form that we looked at a moment ago, the same thinking ref- 
and forms the basis of his project for the 1991 Sao Paulo Biennial, which was subtitled Architecture as Limitation. Speaking to this title and the dichotomy it draws between the body of the individual and the purposes of built structures, curator Jamie Stevens has pointed out that, quote, architecture as limitation is a phrase that speaks directly to the problem of how social design, however ethical or inventive in spirit, will inevitably, inevitably instigate a system of control and authority. In Geist's text story, which recounts the precedents for this project, he asserts that the development of this work began in his classroom in Barlin. Here you can see the um, Vitruvian man in the center. We have a quote by Geis. I asked my students to make a series of photographs of the world they lived in from the perspective of the seven pages of the coloring book. I talked to them about Le Corbusier and his modular. We looked for structures and volume units in existing buildings. I made the outline of the model of the UN building at a scale that could be grasped by man. The emblems of the concentration camp, the coloring book, the idea of an architecture that could be understood enabled us to express an opinion about a problem, world, body, manhood, in a space, a classroom, within a system, the school. Departing from architecture as a sort of confinement, cage, prison, isolation cell, etc., we reversed the rules. Confinement became a privilege. The child in the wooden UN construction was granted freedom to say whatever it wanted. It was granted some kind of parliamentary immunity. Taking the UN building in New York, designed by Wallace Harrison as a starting point, Geist derived a series of architectural models of modernist architectural icons using the golden mean. For instance, buildings by Otto Flues, Le Corbusier, Louis, uh, Louise Barragon, etc. These were reduced to skeletal wooden frames by Geist with the assistance of the architect Guy Mertens. As Geist's uh, public contribution to the Sao Paulo Biennial, it consisted of three components. Firstly, as a series of small maquettes of these models named A constructions. Secondly, as sculptures named B constructions. Uh, as B constructions built at human scale and derived from the smaller models. And thirdly, a much larger construction based on the Villa Wintermans built in Geiss's hometown of Barlin called the C construction. This was built at, the, at a 65% scale of the original building on the grounds of a school in Sao Paulo, well out of the vicinity of and access of the biennial and its audiences. The C constructions as works in the exhibition venue were scaled down to the size of sculptures based on the artist's own body. In the gallery, we might think uh, we might have observed that they speak equally to the, the quote theatricality des designated to minimalist art by Michael Fried, or the architectural models that we find in real estate offices. But what contradicts their uh, quotidian uh, sorry their quotation of uh, minimalism and intentionally troubles their reading? is the introduction of a small sculpture in the, in the shape of the Star of David embedded in the frame of the work, bearing the colours of each nation from which the um, architecture originates. For example, the two colours of the Austrian flag, red and white, form two of the triangles in the interior of the six-pointed star um, here in the building by Adolf Loos. Here's uh, the building by Louise Barragan. This edition may be exemplary of what Geist called the heavily loaded forms, which by their very appearance in the work, lead us to question the symbolism, codification, and purpose of forms that appear in any work of art. In the published for the project, Geist explains how he got to this point. Uh, this is Jeff's words again. We're inclined to dispose of any images which, we can't be, uh, which cannot be used to finish our homework. Is mere scenery for more, more important things that we supposedly have on our mind. To demonstrate this obvious wearing out of images, I started looking for basic forms with a very simple structure but a heavily loaded content. Then I discovered the identification badges of prisoners uh, that they had to wear at concentration camps and personal geometric forms in primary colours with the background a cloud of personal data in contrasting pastel colours. These apparently unimportant things emerging at the surface 
the personal daily objects contrasting with constructions, which seemed too easy to prove, utterly confused me. So I went in search of what connected these daily and obvious banalities. I started thinking about standards. This is perhaps made most apparent by this context in which Geis installed the smaller marquettes, which he called the A constructions. Geis installed these marquettes in the trophy cabinets of various South American and European nations' soccer leagues, and by doing so, I would argue that Geis slyly hints at the competitive na cultural nationalism that biennials often serve. This is apparent in how our attention is drawn to the colours in each of the stars, to the way they function as a signification for certain allegiances, from the tradition of heraldry and its military application through to modern nation states and football teams. In drawing attention to the context of the football stadium, to its own aesthetic codes, myths and forms of spectatorship, Guy subtly undermines the standing of the work of art, or perhaps more aptly, brings it into equivalence with the art of making and a type of reception more in line with mass appeal. To reiterate, this is not about elevating the everyday to the apparent prestige of art, but rather it is an act of bringing the work of art back down to the status of the everyday. And again, in the circular thinking typical of Jeff Geis, this also leads us back to Lodovsky, who designed a soccer stadium uh, in the USSR. Finally, we're at the beginning, um, almost beginning to come full circle. Um, since for, for the third component of the exhibition, Geist responded to an invitation from Paolo Freire, who was then the Secretary of Education in the state of Sao Paulo, and who had been applying his critical pedagogy within the favelas of Sao Paulo, uh, Sao Paulo during the time. For this component, um, titled Casa, or House in English, the skeletal frame of Villa, uh, Villa Winterman is an example of modernist architecture in Geist's locality um, in Mole, which is close to Berlin. It was rebuilt in, on school grounds. Similar to the Reichs Middle School in Berlin, this school was not uh, sited in the urban cultural centre of Sao Paulo, but on the, uh, in an outside locality. The favelas that surround and enclose the city like in the context of the football clubs and leagues, in the favela, guys provided a third context with its own public and rubric for audience reception. Geist's intention was that the transposition of this structure would provide a literal framework for a, uh, for a community to use, with its purposes totally open to community interpretation. This was proved in 2006 with Inga Godelain, a friend and collaborator and ex-student of Geist, traveled to Brazil and interviewed people who were children at the school during the time of the biennial. In this film, sub subsequently photographed on Geis's computer screen and published as a book, the Sao Paulo locals give accounts of how this structure, for a time, was the site of school fairs, parties, village festivals, and even the performance of a clown. Among these testimonials, some people had positive affirmations and some completely reviled it. Crucially, what Geis preempted and what Goldilane's video confirms is that they eventually, the structure was taken apart and other uses were found for its timber. Earlier, he had noted that, quote, it should be a definite and temporary construction, i.e. a construction which can be demolished after, it, after a premeditated decision involving one of the interested parties. In my view, uh, definite temporary constructions are meant to be temporary to relieve distress, to fulfill crying needs. Once the constructions are there, once they start to work, the need disappears. The constructions start living a life of their own. They are used for things which have nothing to do with the original intention. So none of this should be surprising if we return to what I uh, stated at the beginning of this talk. And in a way, I, uh, I'm myself enacting Geis's own circularity, where um, I noted Paolo Freire's influences on Geis's uh, thinking. Just in Freire's radically democratic treatment of education, Geist rethinks the status of the artwork in terms of it as being a means for different audiences. Here with CASA, and quite literally how it can be used as um, at its site. Sorry, here we another image of it. Not in Brazil, but in Belgium. So if we return to thinking of Freire and the democratization of education, we can also return to the context of Jeff Geiss's classroom 
um, and I think at this point you may have been wondering when I was actually going to discuss the classroom itself. Um, I think it's quite natural for us to think about what he did here in the classroom and with his students. But what I want to point out is that it's exactly this desire to know our want to, and our want to penetrate these, spa these spaces that is um, quite contradictory. And there is a um, certain sense of voyeurism to it. Um, so it might seem like I've been evading this subject, but um, and quite particularly because it was titled Jeff Guys in the School. But this brings me to one particular point. What we know of Jeff, uh, Jeff Geis's works in the classroom are only communicated in and through the works that he exhibited and their accompanying anecdotes proffered by Geis himself. In a sense, as viewers, we are locked off from entering the class, like parents that wait outside for their ch children to finish school. We are completely and merely voyeurs when it comes to the classroom. What makes the primacy of the relationship between students and teachers so interesting is it is firstly exclusionary and secondly finite which is to say that when children become adults, the world in the classroom as an almost sacred space ends. It's important to sign firstly the inaccessibility to a teacher-student relationship from the outside. And secondly, like any document of an event, say a work of performance art happening or an exhibition opening, we can only access the projects that happen in Geis's classroom through their site of mediation, be it a work of art or a simple candid photograph. In this photograph of Geis' classroom, we can see a line of students at the back of the room facing Geis' camera with their backs to the wall, where he has painted the definitions of environment, a term which has now been eclipsed by installation, and happening. Typical of, typical of Geis, the terms are given in their, in their original language, English, with a translation in Dutch. Both the students and the descriptive text flank a reproduction made by Geis of Roy Lichtenstein painting, partly obscured in this photo by the classroom's radiant furnace. Importantly here, the pop strategy in, employed by Lichtenstein by appropriating the comic, a literature native to childhood, is returned to the world of, of the child, a category which we should also remember is a relatively new and 19th century invention. Geis painted this in the mid-1960s because, like much of his work, he believed that these concepts, which belonged to the discourses of contemporary art, could easily be comprehended by the students and made useful in the development of their own world outlooks. Similarly, as the women's liberation movement began to shape discourses in the adult world, in 1964, Geist began the series Women's Questions to check the responsiveness of his all-girl class to the questions being asked by contemporary women within a patriarchal society. Here, guys compiled questions sourced from the newspapers and magazines that were asked of women, writing them on a scroll, a scroll of brown uh, butchers or craft paper at the back of his classroom. Existing firstly in this context as a prompt for discussion, the questions were subsequently translated in multiple languages and repeatedly re-inscribed on various scrolls of fabric, wax cloths, for instance, and paper. A cursory glance at any issue of the noticeable multilingual Kempen's Informati blood will show a similar relationship with language. And again, in his series of seed packet paintings that he painted annually from 1963 to 2018, where the names of the pictured plants hang in frames below the painted canvases, typeset in Latin, the paternal language um, of science, the church, and much of Europe, as well as in the vernacular Flemish, indigenous to Geis's everyday language and his instructions at the school. The afterlife of the women's questions evidences um, Geis's fascination with language as a form at the same level as the red heart or six-pointed star. Their place in the exhibition in the exhibition since often installed alongside completely and contrasting series of works ask what the efficiency of translation is not only from one language to another, but also the type of translation that takes place for any artwork as it is transposed from one context to another. This act of transposition, which I think is important to understanding all of Geis's artistic activities, ultimately relies on the productive, the productive capacity of a context and its public to imbibe new meanings, uses and functions. And almost lastly, in 1984, Geist staged an exhibition of works of art from the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Ghent for the 25th anniversary of the Reichs Middle School, 
Learning 61 works by artists including Marcel Brutez, Daniel Brin, Andy Warhol, Lucio Fontana, and David Hockney. And with students, Gaius assembled a catalogue that included a glossary of terms native to contemporary art in, quote, easy to understand language. For this, Jan Hurt, the um, uh, museum's then director, wrote a forward title um, titled Brief Reflections and Loose Thoughts on Museum Art Education. Writing of the strengths of the museum as a point of reception for works of art, he wrote that, quote, with regard to other contexts, however, the museum has the advantage that it still presents the true object of the visual arts and allows the artwork to be experienced as the thing, as an autonomous instrument of communication. Apart from the private collection and the gallery circuit, the museum is the only place where the dialogue between viewer and art can be stimulated and realised. Without the aforementioned institutions, therefore, meeting the specific conditions and functions of the museum, conservation and education. While Geis does not undermine Hurd's progressive ambitions for the museum, by staging this exhibition in the school, Geis points out an inherent contradiction where the supposed neutrality of the museum naturally falls short. In its division from every, everyday experience, a division which is even articulated in, the, in its geographical distance from, from rural life, or more simply, in its inaccessibility for all people. And... Um, he would make a similar intervention later for Hode's famous uh, Chambre d'Army. So this reintroduction of the work of art to vernacular experience, to schools, socialist women's clubs, exhibitions, bars, etc., mostly away from the disinterested gaze of art, exposes it to contexts that offer other uh, sets of use values contingent on, on who those audiences might be and what they might expect from an artist or of a work of art. In contrast, how we experience these works in the space of an art institution is to read it with a certain self-understanding, that is, the criticality that we read any work of art. Earlier I asked what these interventions produce. My answer is that Geis's trick was to supplant this self-consciousness, the same self-consciousness that Freya spoke of in his radical rethinking of education, but also this, the kind of thinking that underwrites much of Enlightenment aesthetics from Kant onwards into everyday experience and extended that same enthusiasm for cre uh, critical scepticism skepti to everyday people. So we might um, meet all of this with the same scepticism, that perhaps Jeff Geis is merely a pariah or a goofy kind of outsider and not the kind of uh, profit of fine art that the art world would like, would like us to uphold. But I often think this binary between insider and outsider is quite tight and simplistic. And Geis's uh, example goes against both of these positions. I think this in-between space is exactly where the figure of the artist is needed in society today, in a place that is eccentric, at once inside and outside. At a place where a man named Jeff Geis can paint his house black to provoke his neighbours and list it as a work of art or install an exhibition showing the collection of the State Museum in the hallways of his workplace at a small rural school. Aan de heer conservator van het Museum van Hedendaagse Kunst te Gent, beste Jan, graag kregen wij van u de hiernaast beschreven werken in Bruikleen. Met deze werken willen wij een tentoonstelling inrichten in de lokalen van onze school. Gezien het bijzonder didactisch karakter voor de leerlingen en de andere mensen uit de omgeving en met uw inzet ter verdediging van de moderne kunst voor ogen, hoop ik op een goed gevolg. Tot ziens, getekend Jeff Gijs. Antwoord. Prachtig getekend Jan Hoed. Dat lees ik allemaal op de affiche van een tentoonstelling, een tentoonstelling van hedendaagse kunst, in de Rijksmiddenschool in Balen. We hebben de briefschrijver Jeff Gijs in studio uitgenodigd. Jeff Gijs, organisator van de tentoonstelling, leraar, kunstenaar. Die tentoonstelling in Balen is bijzonder, is zelfs uniek op meer dan één vlak. Alleen al het, het brengen van een deel van de collectie van het Museum van Hedendaagse Kunst in Gent naar Balen, naar die kleine stad Balen. Ja, 
Is dat nooit eerder gebeurd? Dat is nog nooit eerder okay. gebeurd en ik hoop met Janu dat dat dus nog meermaal zal gebeuren. Wel onder andere vormen misschien. Maar het is eigenlijk een soort van uh, groot verjaardagsgeschenk aan de mensen van Balen, aan de leerlingen en de mensen van de regio. We bestaan dus 25 jaar en ik denk wel dat het dus een gelegenheid is om dus die collectie, die anders verborgen zit, soms in kelders, soms in Tokio zit, soms in Montreal, soms in Parijs, soms in Brussel, om die nu naar Balen te brengen. En, en niet dat... alleen naar Balen, sorry dat ik je onderbreek, nee. maar in een school. In een school. Nou, wel, de school natuurlijk is op de eerste plaats, de aangewezen plaats, om mensen uh, ten eerste op te voeden, ten tweede ook een richting aan te wijzen. En hier in dit geval de richting naar de moderne kunst toe. Een boek te openen waar dus niet alleen plaatjes in staan, maar waar onder de plaatjes verborgen zitten de producten. En het zijn die producten die we dus werkelijk willen confronteren met de leerlingen, met de mensen van Balen. De selectie, hoe is die gebeurd? Is dat een, een individuele keuze, een persoonlijke keuze van iemand? En wat zit erin? Ja, dus die selectie is zeer persoonlijk. Dus ik heb de selectie gedaan om te vermijden dat er uh, nadien zou kunnen verweten worden aan of verweten of verscholen worden achter een bepaalde commissie om daar te verwijzen naar mankementen, uh, ontbrekende stukken en zo verder. Daar heb ik de knoop doorgehakt en ik heb gezegd, kijk, ik doe de keuze. Ik ben dus verantwoordelijk. Men kan bij mij terecht om eventueel kritiek uit te brengen of eventueel om bijkomende inlichtingen. In die keuze zit natuurlijk, gaande van Michaud tot Nasberger, een aantal mensen die in leeftijd verschillen ongeveer 70, 80 jaar. En die productie is ook een staalkaart van wat er allemaal te zien geweest is na 1940 plus minus. Het is dus een uitgebreide staalkaart, een referentiekader, waarop de leerlingen kunnen verder bouwen om nadien eventueel zelf kunnen te selecteren en te zeggen, kijk, dat vind ik goed, dat vind ik minder goed. We zijn ondertussen de tentoonstelling aan het bezoeken op ja. het scherm. We hebben een filmpje laten, uh, laten zien. Mm -hmm. We hebben enkele werken gezien. Hier zie ik niet meteen waar het kunstwerk hangt of staat. Wel, dit is mijn klaslokaal, waar ik dus altijd les geef. En de werken die daar zich bevinden op de achtergrond, mm -hmm. zijn werken van vrienden van mij. En de overheersende... Tendens in de moderne kunst zijn nu in beeld. Op het bord? Op het bord. Is dat ook een kunstwerk? Dat is dus een kunstwerk dat ik samen met Lili Dujury gerealiseerd heb. Mm. En waar ik dus de relatie, ten eerste leerling-leraar, de relatie man-vrouw, de relatie kunst-leerling-man-vrouw-school, politiek enzovoort. Netwerk van relaties. En netwerk van relaties. Mm -hmm. U zegt samenwerking. De tentoonstelling is ontstaan. Natuurlijk in samenwerking ja. met het Museum van Hedendaagse Kunst in Gent. Maar iedereen op school heeft daar meegewerkt. Ja, Leraars, ik, leerlingen. Dat moet ik dus benadrukken. Dat het dus het voltallig personeel is die zich ingezet heeft om dat te realiseren. En het, de begeleidingscatalogus is samengesteld door de leerlingen van mijn klas menswetenschappen. Een heel handig dus Zeer lexicon. handig dat dus ter beschikking staat, gratis, van elke ja. bezoeker. Want daar druk ik op. Ik wilde dus... Ik, ik druk op ik, maar dat is natuurlijk het voltallig personeel in mijn naam ik spreek. wilde dus dat iedereen een uh, zo duidelijk mogelijk document had om de tentoonstelling te begeleiden. Ja. En ik merk daarin dat uh, het mogelijk is om over kunst te spreken zonder totaal uh, onbegrijpelijke woorden te gebruiken. De het is allemaal leerlingen, helder. De leerlingen hebben het trachten te vertalen. Goed, de tentoonstelling in de Rijkse Middenschool in Balen is open tot 30 mei. Elke werkdag vanaf 2 uur tot 8 uur s avonds. Voor de leerlingen heel de dag natuurlijk, neem ik aan. En op zondag van 10 uur tot 18 uur. Dank u wel, chef Gijs. Dank u. Oké, okay, uh, thanks so much for the talk and uh, the um, yeah, enlightening uh, insight and. Uh, so many stories about uh, works that we actually also have on view here in the exhibition in uh, Bergen. And um, the film clip uh, in the end was uh, super nice to see since um, so many of the uh, works uh, in the exhibition is actually not, uh, I don't know, I, have, I, didn't, I didn't see images of this exhibition before I know uh, the catalog and um, of course some of the works Um, but I haven't hadn't seen uh, this document about the exhibition itself, so that's um, really um, an amazing document. And um, also, of course, um, your uh, broader thoughts on the place of um, 
pedagogy or how the uh, the work uh, relates on uh, broader notions to um, uh, Jeff Geis's work. I was wondering um, when um, uh, looking at the uh, abstract for the talk, you mentioned a couple of references such as Bauhaus, um, uh, such as uh, Freire. I was also thinking because it's uh, 2021, uh, it's the 100th, 100th year of um, Josef Voice, the birthday of Josef Voice, and um, coming from Germany and uh, knowing about uh, Jeff Geis's um, radius of operation in uh, the uh, Rhineland region and uh, the kind of close connection of uh, uh, the Belgian context to uh, this German context. I was wondering if... Um, uh, I mean, it's a kind of unlikely uh, reference, but of course uh, there are some connections to uh, uh, the highlighting of uh, creativity, of everyday uh, life creativity in voices over as well, or approach, but in a very different way. And um, mm. if you came across any kind of uh, thoughts to this, um, his practice. Um, no, yeah, that's an interesting um, connection. And also, th thank you, first of all, for the invitation. It's uh, really nice to share. And of course, amazing to share this video, which we can thank the Belgian public television for making in the first <laughs> place. Um, um, I I would have to double check, but from what I saw, um, I don't think uh, Jeff had much many good things to say about Joseph Boys. Oh. Um, and um, uh, from my own context, you know, although being based in Germany, I'm not German, so my relationship to Boys is something else. Um, but um, I think there is a there is a big difference in uh, thinking about their own maybe uh, predilections for liking each other's work or something, but just the fact that um, you know, Boys was an artist who taught art in, a, in an art academy and the very di very um, uh, decisive difference is, is Jeff was a school teacher who taught art um, and happened to be an artist. <laughs> That's I think really I always think of the vocation first with Jeff and with Boys I always think of the fact that he was an artist. And I think uh, this this distinction is quite important um, uh, because I, in a lot of Jeff's work, it seems like it it um, proceeds from that kind of everyday or vocational um, activity, um, whereas we know that uh, my boys had much more utopian um, ideals and saw the position of the artist as as maybe a more utopian kind of figure, and I'd I'd put him more in a kind of romantic tradition. Yeah. Um, then in class is maybe like more practical. Um, um, the, the one thing I don't mention, which I think is important to know, is that um, um, uh, when uh, when a guy started teaching um, at the school, it was um, uh, um, alongside Walter Vandenberg, who was um, a Belgian author, postmodernist author. And they were both interested in Brecht, and they were both looking at Brechtian theatre, and um, also with Paul Frere's whole critical pedagogy comes out of a re reading of Brecht. So it's really this um, thinking of, I mean, Frere used the position of the student, Brecht uses the position of the audience in theatre, Geist uses the position of the viewer in art. It's or depending what the view of the viewer is, uh, is kind of what I say is that the viewer changes with what kind of public it is. But if we think even just in our like fine art context in the museum or art institution, yeah, Jeff Geis is addressing that viewer in a really particular way. And that kind of distanciation or alienation effect, I think, which is often the English translation, um, is about that um, creating that distance in order to um, 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 uh, let me put it another way. 
I think Geiss's works are propositions that um, that promote a kind of critical um, thinking in the in the viewer, where they ask us to ask questions of our own thinking, of our own of our own viewing, our own possession, perception of the work, and it's that kind of feedback loop um, that creates that kind of critical distance and critical thinking, which I guess was kind of the thesis of my talk, more or less. But um, I just wanted to point out that there's that, also that connection between Frere and Brecht, and I think that's a that's a really important like art historical um, kind of note that I didn't mention in the talk. Yeah, true. Um, also, if we're going to talk about Germans, we're going to talk about Brecht and not boys. <laughs> we what? Also, because uh, you brought up a German, so I responded with another German. <laughs> it's, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, but it's, uh, I mean, there's certainly like, it's interesting to see this kind of like um, these uh, different, uh, very different approaches and, um, and that happen uh, uh, quite uh, similarly in, a, in the same period of time. And there are some kind of like uh, strange connections. And I guess in the, in the German context, there's often the kind of reference to boys uh, when, when thinking about pedagogy, but also the kind of uh, use of autobiography in work uh, or uh, style, maybe like a self-stylization in uh, biography. And um, but of course, very different. And the, the difference is interesting, the kind of soberness in guys, the kind of uh, uh, yeah, the interest in uh, in terroir or uh, context or publics, as you mentioned, um, versus maybe in in boys, the interest in myth and uh, maybe it's almost something like immersion, something where the work tries to draw people in. And uh, uh, um, while in 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 guys' work, it's more like, uh, yes, you said like pushing them out. Um, uh, the classroom is um, a space that. Uh, People don't enter, um, but uh, maybe it's interesting because you mentioned you, you spoke so much, so much about um, publics and uh, an interesting question, of course, when making an exhibition uh, with works by Jeff Guys is um, that uh, we often deal with uh, just one of these uh, spaces, the museum or the, uh, in our case, uh, a public institution in in Norway and. Um, so it becomes this, um, in a way, the exhibition becomes a, a medium of uh, mediation of a work. It's we handle with artworks, but um, as you also mentioned, also with documents and um, uh, kind of references that help to to um, represent this uh, larger project um, by Jeff Guys. Um, but still, there is there's always a kind of um, a lack a lack of the difference uh, the different publics that uh, can't be literally brought into uh, the museum. So in a way, the uh, marking that uh, the fact that relationality that uh, yeah the museum is always just one of the many places that um, guys himself uh, was keen to um, interact with his work. And I wonder, um, also like from your own experience, um, how you handled or saw that in um, dealing with uh, Geis's work. Um, I, mean, it's, I, I think it's interesting in the, the the quote that I mentioned at the end, Jan Hurt, who, um, who um, was the director of the museum, who borrowed the work. He's that the, you know he's directors. What's that? <laughs> he's the use of boys of directors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> I mean, did some amazing work. But it's interesting um, what he writes for that catalog is this progressive notion of the museum, and this is how museums mostly see themselves today, and what we all hope for our institutions to bring as many people and to be these kind of welcoming civic spaces, etc. But um, what Jeff points out is that no matter how hard you try at the end, there is always, always a limit. There's always a certain level of class or cultural privilege um, that defines who goes to a museum and vice versa. And I think the most beautiful thing about that exhibition is that it happens in Berlin and 
I'm also someone who from a rural background and um, you realize, okay, museums are always in a city. Museums are always sited in a cosmopolitan place. Um, and that kind of simple geographic division is one of those divisions. So even who can, um, who can visit a museum comes down to a, a logistical or transportation issue, basically. Um, so for me, I think that's, um, that's one of the interesting contradictions he points out. Um, but for me, I mean, just speaking personally, I was yeah, t working as a school teacher and I think this work in a way, um, yeah, did, did instruct my work there as just as much as it instructed my work as a, as a curator. And I mean, um, um, getting to, um, a lot of the points that I made in this talk, the fact that, uh, the relationship between student and teacher is something that's finite and also, um, kind of delimited was the fact that I was a teacher. I mean, I don't think I would have got to that point otherwise. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, of course I also curated a show with Jeff. I mean, he, um, passed away just before it opened and, um, in working with him, I guess I also came to understand that his way of working was um, imbibed with these kind of um, lessons. We could we could say that he um, that he um, uh, was not a straightforward kind of artist to work with. That he would uh, give you kind of instructions and homework to do. Um, and, uh, send you on missions. And this was something that, um, I think was important for me at the time being a young curator that, um, this artist, um, I mean, really, uh, asked you to do the work. And if you were actually interested in working with him, you had to do certain things, you had to go visit certain people, get certain information, da, 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 da. And, um, yeah, I mean, this is a very much a student teacher kind of relationship and, um, 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 this I found interesting and also, um, yeah, instructive and the, the work that we ended up making uh, was a, was a piece called, um, the shadows of Lisbon, which, um, essentially was a kind of instructionary piece, which, um, was derived from a previous exhibition um, at Kunsthalle Lisbon, where another curator, Miguel von Schneider, um, was asked um, to select some photographs um, from a contact sheet. And these were photographs that Jeff had taken in Lisbon um, many, many years ago on, um, on holiday. Um, he instructed Miguel to blow up these images to different sizes and then to hang the originals on top of them. So he blew up these into, um, uh, into wallpaper. His instru instruction for me was to um, take this wallpaper from Lisbon and to remount it and crop it onto paravents. Um, what was interesting about this is that he basically completely off offloaded the, um, the aesthetic decisions of the work. First of all, Miguel had made certain decisions about how big these images were going to be. And then once I got the recycled version of this um, wallpaper, I had to decide what the crops were and how the images fit together and et cetera. So what was quite interesting about this, that it pointed back to the role of the curator as a kind of window dresser. The curator is a kind of uh, uh, interior designer or <laughs> something like this. Someone who has a lot of choice in how the, the artwork and an exhibition is communicated and how it is aesthetically put together. And he's really pointing to that, um, to those decisions that a curator makes, um, and making them, you know, as I said earlier with the coloring books, you know, he's, he's, he's playing with this, um, this level, level of authorship in the work, um, and control. Um, so in a sense, that's just also to say there was a, there was a certain lesson in that work for me as well. Uh, 
Yeah, there was, I mean, maybe just w one observation, like interesting about this uh, destabilization, because they also, I guess he, he, he um, used these elements also for himself. So that's also like how I understood um, the women's question and uh, his use of them. Um, I mean, as this kind of recurring uh, element of exhibitions, but also in the classroom where he placed them, that it was also uh, in this kind of like inevitable um, authority that he had as a teacher towards um, uh, the class. Uh, in a way, the women's questions were also um, a kind of critical inquiry, very much into his own role um, as a kind of um, male teacher. Uh, representing uh, a certain dominant pattern of uh, power. And in a way, like by placing that, it was an invitation to 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 um, challenge this uh, role. And um, I mean, in a way, it's kind of also, uh, it seems to me to have a similar function in um, exhibition spaces. And actually, the questions are, <laughs> until today, really uh, fantastic and uh, really valid, mm. which is kind of uh, nice to see. Or oh, not nice to see, actually. Yeah, um, yeah this work, I, I don't know, I, I find um, to be one of the more problematic parts of the practice. And um, it's one of the works that I've wrestled with a lot. And I've come back to over and over again. Um, of course, it is um, it is quite dated in many ways. Yeah. Um, it, it, of course, it does point to this question of okay, what does this mm, what does this guy uh, what is his right to talk about these questions or to be in this role, et cetera, et cetera, and for it to be part of the work and to be valued. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the same time. Uh, you can um, point to the fact that it was co-authored co in many ways by the students. The students actually um, added a lot of the questions that were there. So there is that kind of destabilizing element to it at the same time. Um, so there is a bit of an escape shoot. Um, but um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, there is... Um, elements of the practice that are incredibly gendered and this and this does um, offer some uh, a position to, to critically uh, intervene and look at it in a different way um, and yeah I guess on, on one side you could say that you know this is because it depends so highly on Western art history and its references to Western art history uh, and the other side that's also the problem <laughs> That it reproduces these kinds of um, these kinds of uh, um, biases or this kind of hegemonic ideas or whatever. Um, for instance, with the cow passports, which are quite humorous, but at the same time, I think they're quite misogynistic in how um, they're framed. Um, the uh, you know it, it it is a bad joke basically um, that the the cows, of course. Then there's no bulls. There's only female cows being pictured, and um, the way they're named and the way they're they're, they're imaged, etc. It is another again this idea of portraiture, idea of women's portraiture, um, and I mean of course against the kind of seriality, etc. Um, but that I mean that's my like two second critique. But there's there's more there to look at. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean. Uh... Yeah, there's. Um, I mean, the datedness. Uh, there's some of the some some other works which are kind of more closely uh, connected to uh, sexuality and uh, maybe also like to ideas of uh, sexual liberation. And um, um, I mean, basically, like uh, 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 entangled with um, histories also of uh, kind of hippie culture and politics mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. um, like very much part of uh, a kind of political discourse of the time and um, yeah which obviously require 
revision and maybe um, uh, a framing or so. Um, um, oh, completely. And I mean, the uh, I mean, you, you start for the fact that today sexuality and gender are not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that um, that yeah, we can have se- we can discuss sexual liberation, um, uh, and that's a, a whole whole different topic. Um, and I think that is that is actually an element of the work that um, also not many people put about. Um, and I think actually, I mean, actually is an interesting topic in art that generally people don't talk about is sexuality. Um, and this, this was, um, this was, um, something that was very much in, 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 um, Geis's practice. I mean, there's also a lot of reference to pornography and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, this does, uh, this does connect it also to this kind of, um, um, counterculture publishing and um yeah transgressive films and that kind of thing of the time which is a far cry from something like joseph boys so (laughs) just to think that there's also like you know i mean that's um this is like really red light district art (laughs) in many ways it's not the okay you're not at the academy i mean it's um it's it's tied to something quite visceral and quite um uh yeah i mean also i think that's also the thing is like even if even i say it's it's problematic this is from my perspective my own personal politic whatever um you can tell that there is not supposed to be any political correctness in the work that there is all there's actually a lot of dirty jokes and this kind of thing so um although today i was looking very much at this kind of serious pedagogical side there's also this side of uh, jeff guys that's kind of like full of dirty jokes and uh i would say a bit very particular kind of belgian humor as well that is um very much not politically correct in any sort of way um so there's that kind of dichotomy there uh, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, maybe what 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 connects uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this to um, his broader approaches. I mean, it, it's Belgian humor, but it's also uh, this interest in the vernacular, or um, mm-hmm. it's uh, the kind of uh, embeddedness, and um, like uh, the same way that he used. Um, a, a local advertising uh, newspaper uh, and made it into his turned it into his own uh, publishing house uh, the way that he used uh, car workshops or um, um, etc that is was an interest in in uh, kind of uh, microcultures or so and maybe and that's that's I mean it's interesting uh, to think of that uh, I mean again it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a fine line, and uh, while it's while um, uh, kind of um, the interest in publics um, I guess what's maybe it's, it's a broader discussion on how to to reframe a, the kind of politics of publics um, in times when uh, uh, of new right of. Uh, yeah, new conservatism, conservatism, and uh, the new right, old right, um, and uh, their focus on uh, what the people say, or so. Mm. Um. Well, it's always a, a question of uh, yeah, who is who is in power of a certain yeah. hegemonic discourse, and. Um, yeah, I mean, we know that cultural institutions change with this as well. You know, what, whatever is the hegemonic kind of discourse at the moment or the yeah. political, what's in the zeitgeist, changes our, 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 our moral or um, eth- eth- ethical and indeed aesthetic outlook on things. So I think that's, I mean, that, I mean now I'm enacting that kind of criticality again, right? You, you, you're questioning why why in which you might judge something in a certain in a certain sense and of course it is because of these preconceptions that we have at the moment um um 
But um, to go back to what you said about localities, I think that's one of the really important um, parts of the work and something that I always go back to is um, is um, that question of localism. And, of course, I mean, in Europe you have many dialects, many microcultures all next to each other. It's, you know, you drive 15 kilometres and you're a different country, unlike where I'm from. And this is sort of a natural fact of the of the continent. Yet there's this kind of um, um, there has been this kind of ideology in art for the last I don't know two hundred years or more, um, modernism, etc. In universalism, that it should that, that works of art should not be so local that they've moved away. At least I would say at least since impressionism or something like that that um, they've moved away from those particularities. And um, there's the general idea as well that art should be kind of universally understood, that any uh, artwork should be immediately grasped by someone. And I think what Geiss's work does well is kind of plays with this, with these two levels, the intensely local, yeah, bringing it into like these kind of universal categories or questions. And... Um, I guess um, the one thing I also wanted to say is that um, w the way I found out about Geis' work first was through the newspaper, um, that we had a copy of the newspaper where I was working at the time, and there was a picture of SpongeBob SquarePants on the front, and I honestly just thought, what is this? <laughs> Like, what artist is making this today? <laughs> it did not make sense. It did not fit into, like, what I had sort of, like, decided contemporary art was at this time. And this was quite many years ago now. I was much younger, but still. It was um, confusing um, because it was so, uh, yeah, I mean, vernacular. I mean, it was vernacular photography. It was like a cell phone kind of photograph of, like, uh, this thing that he had made for his grandsons that was on top of the fridge. And, you know, it's the kind of photo that your grandparents take. It's, it was not a, <laughs> it's not a highly aestheticized uh, image. Um, so to ask, okay, what is this? What, why is this here? That is what really, um, uh, attracted me to, to guys in the first place. And it was that question of, okay, well, why is this relevant? Like beyond this, uh, this nitty gritty of like this person and what they're doing. And the Informati blood does a good job of trying to dig up those, those, that problem. And, um, I mean, this is also the time where there was much less information on the practice in English. So, um, you're dealing with the problem of translation and this kind of language gap. Uh, so what you can learn through the work is really just through what this, this strange side of mediation, which there's not so much information, there's blank spots. And I mean, if you open the Informati blood, nothing is ever straightforward. Um, there's things that have been reproduced from all over the place. Um, usually none of it's referenced. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All you know is that it's from a certain show or a certain uh, period or a certain uh, whatever. And um, and then you have to start your research. Yeah, and that's how it is actually until today. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, so we'll make a book about the show uh, for the show, but it's not going to be a catalog, obviously. It um, uh, has to uh, figure out a way. Um, how to make a book on uh, Jeff Geis today. Uh, no retrospective, right. uh, no catalog. <laughs> hey, that's, um, uh, was really nice uh, seeing you and talking and um, hearing you. Thanks so much. Great. And, uh, Once again, thank you. Yeah. Till bye -bye. next time, thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>